all your Kubernetes clusters. So uh, this would uh, be great if we would have something in the Kubernetes cluster where we can uh, basically share the information throughout uh, all our clusters. Right. So just as a note, I managed to get the recording started. Um, so we, we are actively recording in the background now. Um, the question on the table was about the new certificate registration uh, capability in the API. Is that was that right? Uh, yeah, and just what uh, what the expected take up on it is, I guess. Um, so I, I had a chance to talk to Mike Denise about about this about this feature and the features I was hoping he'd come into cluster ops to give us a, a talk about it specifically. Um, I expect this, the, the feature actually to get a lot of adoption because of the way I'm seeing people want to bring up um, worker nodes with zero with zero config. Um, and this is, I, my understanding of this feature is it enables that capability really well. So you can inject certificates, credentials, and configuration into the API server and then have, if, I'm, if I understand what, what's the feature you're asking about is, and then have new workers boot into that environment? Was that, was that the feature you were thinking of? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's the, the, so there's the auto signing, um, but then also it's because of the auto signing, it's mean having the certificate authority inside the cluster. Um, right. So that could be used for also users, syst you know, system master accounts, et cetera, et cetera. Right. But the main use right now is obviously node onboarding. Right. The use cases that I've seen people interested in um, for, for ex expanding and contracting their clusters, it seems like it's super powerful. Um, and and would, would be really popular. And it, it will actually change some of the deployment patterns that we see out there. Um, like I think the tube spray stuff, it might significantly simplify what you have to do to get a node onboarded. Um, I think it lines with cargo, um, and I, I, it lines with the core OS and immutable concept. If, if I'm, I'd love to, do other people have opinions on that? You mean uh, on the core OS concept or uh, on the um, general tectonic concepts? Core OS. I don't know tectonic well enough, unfortunately, to speak to it. Well, we're we're basically using core OS um, exactly in the immutable way, uh, and we we are using it in memory so that uh, basically a reboot resets everything. Right, and then and then, are you creating a cloudnet file with all of the machine configuration and profile on it? Well, I, I think uh, that we should move oh. into the presentation then. Because there's a lot of more than this. <laughs> I, I think I, I think it's a great idea. What what why don't we what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try and get this as a primary agenda topic for a future meeting, but I I want I really want to get Mike Denise in it because he's the author of the feature and we could have a much more robust discussion about pros and cons. And he actually was describing some um, hardware signing capabilities that you could look at for this, um, if you were doing bare metal. So it's there's some really cool stuff. It's going to take us it's probably a 30 or a full hour conversation. So if y'all don't mind, we'll talk about that. We'll turn over to Stefan to talk about his environment, um, and I'll sit down and take some notes. Stefan, the floor is yours. Pardon? Go ahead. The floor is yours. So, so shall I start, though? Yes, please. Okay. Hello. Okay. I hope you can see my screen, though. Yes. Okay. Well, um, so just shortly telling something about me, though. Um, I'm a global topic lead uh, for container technology at SAP. Uh, we basically designed a full automated uh, concepts to build up uh, bare metal clusters without uh, any need to know what hardware comes up there. Um, so, um, yeah. 
Uh, our department is working together with uh, a couple of other departments in SAP, specifically uh, the learning departments uh, that do the trainings and uh, all the um, yeah informations for the developers. So um, yeah, we're, we're also organizing some some kinds of uh, internal um, conferences. Uh, we're planning to also come up with something in the future, probably external. Uh, anyhow, I'm, I'm running around. So I was on a Berlin buzzwords. Uh, I was on a DevOps con in Berlin and probably uh, I will be on the DevOps con in Munich then also. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm coming around and holding some talks from time to time also today here. Um, well, um, that said, I mean, um, this is kind of an example for a Kubernetes cluster deployment uh, from the infrastructure perspective. Uh, well, you don't have to uh, look on the master nodes like fixed master nodes because uh, master nodes at our Kubernetes clusters are basically only described because we have master services running on those cluster, uh, those nodes. Um, but those uh, master services are kind of floating because uh, they are maintained by uh, let's say themselves, because the Kubernetes master implementation maintains the amount of uh, master instances in the cluster. And if we lose one master uh, or the hardware beyond, uh, it will be automatically redistributed in the cluster. Um, yeah, you see that we have uh, um, the violet one here, uh, that this is a deployment uh, Pixie boot server. Uh, which we basically set up also based on core S and with containers. And um, we have uh, um, an external cluster LAN, uh, internal cluster LAN. Well, the storage LAN is basically optional. And um, through the deployment LAN, we are serving at the cluster with the uh, operating system, with uh, internet uh, stuff, so like containers from the internet and stuff like that. Um, and uh, through the internal cluster LAN, all the Kubernetes traffic goes through, uh, besides the service traffic, uh, which is going to the outside world, that goes through the external cluster LAN. So we basically uh, divide the traffic in uh, physical layers on the physical cluster implementations, and we can have uh, as many clusters as we like and do some federation on that one. That basically, uh, it's just an example with two data centers because adding a third one, uh, you would not be able to uh, identify anything anymore then. Um, yeah. So um, the deployment server cluster uh, services architecture looks like this. Looks a little uh, crazy, but um, we have a etcd cluster as a base which is uh, built up uh, by booting the uh, deployment servers from an ISO. Everything here is uh, based on containers. So the etcd is a, in a container, the DHCP, the DNS, and also the so-called registration service, which is a homegrown tool, uh, including a TFTP. And uh, all that is based on the configuration in the etcd. So the etcd cluster maintains all cluster configurations. Uh, with such a deployment cluster, we can uh, build up uh, multiple Kubernetes clusters. So uh, we don't have one deployment cluster per Kubernetes cluster. We have a deployment cluster per, for example, a data center or multiple data centers, meaning probably a region or something like that. Um, so at the moment, we, we have it per data center, but uh, might grow up to regions in the future. Yeah, um, so um, taking you through the uh, deployment, basically we have uh, operating system booting via the ECP, which you see is a, a containerized service, then we go for TFTP. I mean, I will not explain the, the small parts, I guess all of you know them. Um, so uh, we're booting IPixie then, and through IPixie we deliver the configuration for the booting, uh, meaning uh, where to take the cloud config from. A cloud config uh, is then uh, also delivered by the uh, registration service um, and all the other kinds of things like uh, binaries and uh, stuff are also delivered through the registration service. Um, 
as well as the kernel, the RAM disk, and the configuration files uh, in general. The registration service also maintains a CMDB. And uh, also, we have, uh, due to the needs of Kubernetes to have an etcd, we need an initial setup for the first node, which uh, basically sets up an etcd server on, on the node and then uh, configures the networking and all this so that we can basically start coming up uh, with a Kubernetes uh, initial instance. And uh, if we have done enough nodes, uh, like more than the amount of defined master instances, uh, we reboot the initial master so it gets uh, a standard node. Well, that's already everything. If you have questions, I'm open-minded. I'm kind of curious because you mentioned like, you know, you're bootstrapping uh, the per cluster etcd. Uh, are you keeping that outside of Kubernetes, or are you, are you going to like drop it into the etcd operator or anything on those ones? Uh, you're talking about the Kubernetes etcd or the deployment yes. etcd? No, the <laughs> Kubernetes etcd. The Kubernetes etcd. Uh, we basically bootstrap only the first etcd node. And then uh, we deploy a master pod that doesn't contain an etcd uh, in the cluster. And this master pod then connects to the etcd. And uh, after that, we deploy a, a definition how many master instances we want to have in the Kubernetes cluster. And uh, then we have master pods containing etcd and the master components like scheduler, controller manager, and the API server. So that all is basically uh, configured in one pod. And uh, Kubernetes takes over the maintainment of the etcd and the master nodes itself. OK. What do you, what do, you do to coordinate and upgrade for a patch on those containers? Uh, pardon? I mean, uh, you mean if we, uh, how we do the, the updating of the containers? Right. So, so delivering a new Kubernetes version or something like that. Exactly. Do you have a, a control script, or you just use the cuddle or against the control cluster? Well, we we do it with a deployment, okay. standard Kubernetes deployment. And do you do them like one cluster at a time? So every time you add a cluster, you're still you, each each cluster is individually controlled. Uh, you mean uh, in general, like operating system updates, though? I, uh, I guess so. That that's a that wasn't what I meant. Another <laughs> question. I was because thinking, in a cluster federation, you know, uh, we can do it in multiple regions at the same time. So uh, we can do it in parallel. We don't need to do it per cluster, though. Right, but did you? Uh, did you did you Coming add back to, to the to our original story, probably uh, yeah. we have we have an automated testing in front of uh, the production updates. So uh, we basically don't use the standards tooling from CoreOS or stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. So we we have a kind of a, a let's say a CI CD pipeline in front where we uh, check the versions uh, of Kubernetes and. Uh, if everything is compatible with our current setup and everything works out at the end. Mm -hmm. And after that is done, uh, we can mattering on the definition of the cluster. So basically the configuration, if it's a cluster where we manually update like per click, uh, or if we do the update completely automated, then uh, this is uh, done directly after the testing. So, um, no manual work anymore then. Right. And then and then you set up a boot uh, uh, an incremental reboot cycle through your cluster to change out the core OS in which yeah, exactly. That that is also a, a point where we have a per cluster uh, configuration option, so we can say okay. Uh, we have a specific need to test something uh, like like an application that needs more time to boot up or to start up uh, until it's ready so that we can uh, say, okay, we ensure first that the application's up and running again, and then we boot the next node. But this is also 
uh, kind of a, a thing. If we can do that automated, we do it automated. Otherwise, we have a, a per a per node click, <laughs> so that we uh, click on the node now, update the operating system. Okay. And did you automate the process of, of tracking whether the systems are drained and then you can move through? Like, do you talk to the, their application to first, that process? First we, first we drain, then we scan uh, if all the containers are running. That is for the aut fully automated stuff. We basically okay. use the API to drain the, uh, the uh, one node by, uh, after the other. And then we have a look at if all containers are up and running again. And if all containers are up and running again, we reboot the node. Okay. And then we do the same with the other node, one by one, rolling update. Okay. Do you, and, and they, do you supervise that process or do you, you just sort of queue it once it's open and then you let it go? We, we have monitoring outside, so uh, we are scanning if the servers are up and running, if Kubernetes is running and all this. So if okay. anything goes wrong, we are stopping the, uh, the automated process. Uh, so, so we get to know, oh shit, something happened. Uh, okay. I cannot continue here. And then an alert is dropped. So you have a circuit breaker type of yes. action. Very nice. Yeah, you have to have it, otherwise you destroy a cluster. <laughs> yeah, right. That makes, that makes sense. You know, how long does it? Um, I'm not sure that matters. Um, but then, so it, to change out the containers that are driving your controller, um, do you have an automation process for that also? But um, your apps. So right, we have your app level. You have the From the controller, manager. you mean the deployment or uh, the deployment server, or what do you mean? Uh, the controller, the control plane. So your the Kubernetes control plane control is plane. Kubernetes, and right. this Kubernetes control plane is deployed via a deployment in Kubernetes. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and and do you have an automated upgrade for the control plane also? Like or, yeah, we use the deployment functionalities. Okay. So and, uh, and how, how do you decide when to make a change for that? Well, we, we do that with the automated uh, build pipe. Yeah. So, so we scan the new versions, uh, the new Kubernetes version, and if we find a new one that is released, okay. we uh, build uh, some uh, uh, single clusters first and test if everything works out in a single cluster. Then we uh, do the same with a federated cluster. And after everything worked out, uh, we then have the two-way thing like a manual update and automated update. Wow, okay. You guys are really doing complex ops. That's really nice. And I didn't say it's not complex. <laughs> no, no, I actually, I meant, it, I meant complex in a complementary way, right? You're, you're doing a level of uh, control and you know management in this in the which which is fantastic it's showing that you know, you're, you're very deliberate in what versions you have how those roll get rolled out um, and then you have the ability to make a broad scale change in a controlled way yeah. so uh, i mean uh, when we started doing that uh, about two years ago uh, even two and a half I mean now uh, yeah, we we um we basically started doing uh, the first deployment was Cobbler, <laughs> and uh, I mean uh, Cobbler is a, a nice tool, but uh, you have to maintain MAC addresses, or you are only able to serve one cluster uh, with one Cobbler server. So um, we uh, thought about how to get this done uh, for multiple clusters uh, with as less ops as needed. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, um, we don't want to have uh, no ops, meaning no operations team, yeah? But mm -hmm. uh, we want to have a zero ops, meaning an operations team that has to do nothing. Okay. Makes a lot of sense. Do you, do you have additional performance monitoring on the system so you collect data and statistics and roll up the, the cluster performance? Well, this is, this is what we do with our monitoring implementation. Mm -hmm. 
we are using CoScale for this. So um, basically, we, we have uh, overall cluster deployment uh, via daemon sets. So, so CoScale okay. is deployed via a daemon set that is automatically deployed in the Kubernetes cluster. And uh, after this uh, CoScale, um, no, it's not code scale, it's co-scale, like corporation scale. <laughs> Oh, no, 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 and cool. On, only CO, CO scale. Ah, uh, okay. Sorry. I was like, oh. <laughs> you're taking great minutes. Thank you. No matter what. Uh, uh, basically, uh, we, we've been uh, analyzing a lot of uh, tools for monitoring Kubernetes clusters. Um, but uh, CoScale was the most advanced one. Um, because it's it's just pretty easy. CoScale itself is based on containers, and uh, you basically uh, just need to deploy a daemon set in the Kubernetes cluster, and it's monitored. So uh, that's that's just uh, you mo can monitor even the container lifecycle. It has uh, artifactual intelligence. So uh, with this artifactual intelligence, it has uh, something that they call anomaly detection. So you can get alerts on anomalies that happen in your cluster. Uh, like, oh shit, I have a performance impact now because a container is running crazy. Um, then you get uh, an alert where you didn't even ever define something. Yeah. So it's uh, yeah, you don't have to do anything. Very nice. I as I said, zero ops. <laughs> is CoScale a, are you deploying and managing the, the server infrastructure for that too? Or you, is that an offsite monitoring? So oh, no, uh, we, we, have it, we have it on premise. Um, okay. so, so we are, uh, we are maintaining the uh, CoScale server itself also. While uh, the CoScale server at, as of now is um, okay. also a containerized implementation. In the future, they are working on deploying a co-scale server on Kubernetes. So uh, basically, you can then deploy your monitoring server in a federated Kubernetes cluster as a cluster implementation. And then you can monitor your Kubernetes cluster with the service running in your Kubernetes cluster. <laughs> <laughs> I, so it's it's like the the egg and uh, chicken thing, you know. Yeah. No. Afterwards, you don't know what was first. <laughs> this is cool. So, from that perspective, I mean, you're you're doing a pattern that I'm seeing more and more, which is you have a master cluster that you run the control planes for other clusters. Is that a fair, a fair no. assessment? No. No. Okay. We don't uh, have we don't have a Kubernetes cluster where we run the control plane for other clusters. Uh, the Kubernetes each Kubernetes cluster maintains its own control plane. Oh, okay. I thought you, you had a master control plane that would run the that would run the control plane for other clusters. So how do you bootstrap the control planes? Well. Um, as I described, we first uh, for for a new cluster, we first uh, start up uh, etcd, and then we deploy the Kubernetes control plane, and afterwards we deploy uh, deployments for the Kubernetes control plane on the Kubernetes control plane, and whenever new nodes come up, um, then they get one instance of the control plane, and then as you see here in point three. If uh, we have a, a bigger amount of uh, nodes than the master instances, we reboot this initial node where we set up the etcd out of the control plane. And after that, uh, it's a standard node. And we only have uh, pods containing the whole, whole control plane, including the etcd, maintained okay. by the control plane itself. So this is, this is a kube on kube. Bootstrap, and then you destroy the you destroy that first master effectively, so yeah, that exactly. you can then run it. Do you, do you find that there's a maximum number of masters? Do you just keep adding masters. 
Pardon? Uh, is that, is the, the, the define I understood, but the rest was broken. Uh, so is how many masters do you, do you, do you just always have a master per node, or do you stop after you have five masters? No, no, no the minimum uh, amount of uh, uh, master instances is three for the quorum, and the maximum right. amount we defined is nine. No okay. more than nine clusters, uh, 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 master instances, because after nine instances, uh, the uh, increasing uh, lack of performance is taking uh, over more than uh, you get out of the more instances. That makes sense. So, are you using Kubernetes to control replication count from that perspective, or, or do you have an, another way of knowing that you have nine master nodes or five master nodes, however many masters? Well, uh, what we do is we have a, um, a central configuration file. Um, there, as you see here, at from point one, uh, the registration service configures the, the nodes and the DHCP and all that based on the overall cluster configuration. The overall cluster configuration is stored in the deployment cluster, in the etcd cluster here. So uh, basically, uh, you have uh, for all the clusters, the configuration stored in an etcd cluster. And uh, in there, there's also the amount of master instances uh, and etcd instances at the same time, because we deliver master and etcd always as a couple. And uh, uh, this amount you configure per cluster. Right. Um, you wanted to change that number if you had a cluster that had say three and you wanted to take it up to five is that something that's done here or is that done directly against the cluster itself well uh, you do it here and then uh, basically um, you have an implementation in the registration service to check what is the current amount of masters configured as this was changed and uh, then we uh, see okay we have less masters than we wanted. So uh, we just increase the amount of instances to be deployed. And if we have more instances than we wanted to have, then we decrease one by one until we achieve the final uh, amount of uh, master instances. Actually, so the registration service is doing more than just like, it's got TFTP in the diagram, but it's doing more yes. than just that. It's actively yeah, yeah, yeah. probing and-, it, and TFTP it is just included there out of uh, easiness to say, because uh, it's just, uh, it was just pretty easy to get TFTP in that. Yeah, it's the primary, if you're doing Pixie, TFTP is the primary protocol. Yeah. But the registration service does far more than just uh, deliver TFTP and uh, the the PIX, IPIXI image. Uh, so so basically, uh, yeah. the registration service is the base of uh, all configuration for all clusters. So it delivers the cloud config. Uh, it delivers all the templates uh, for all the scripts. It delivers the software. Uh, basically, all all of that is done uh, through the registration service. Hmm. So, I guess my original impression of this was that you were running a master Kubernetes cluster with your Kubernetes masters on that. Why, why did you want to put those local to the clusters instead of uh, doing a, central, a centralized uh, master or centralized set of masters? I've seen other, the reason I ask is I've seen that pattern with your scale, I've seen the pattern of we run a Kubernetes cluster that runs the master nodes, and then all of the the clusters we bring up are just workers from that perspective. Honestly, uh, I don't see any any uh, anything we could get out of this uh, <laughs> because uh, if the the one and only maintaining cluster uh, then breaks down, uh, you don't have uh, any control on uh, what cluster might be running afterwards or not. And at the same time, if you're running all the masters for all your clusters in that one cluster, you will also have a performance lag between the nodes and the master instances. So uh, for, for us, it's uh, we need performance, we want performance, and uh, therefore we run the clusters uh, not based on other clusters. Okay, that's a reasonable thing. Um, 
was okay. And then did you, I thought I saw, I didn't, I didn't, I don't remember seeing in this presentation, but you had talked about your networking in the, in, in the past. I mean that one. That one. Ah. <laughs> Right, but no, what I was looking for is Calico or uh, uh, yes, yes, yes. What's your, what's your, what's your SDN? We we do uh, multi tenancy with Calico in the clusters. And how did you choose Calico? What was the decision matrix for that? Wow, that's that's uh, already uh, some time ago, to be honest. Um, <laughs> and we had a, a long list. I think it was. Uh, 20 points we uh, would have liked to have. So basically we defined a list of, of things we wanted to have, like uh, performance, like integration of the Kubernetes network configuration, uh, like uh, the multi-tenancy with standard rule sets and, and stuff like that. So it was a longer list of features we uh, would have liked to see. Yeah as well as uh, we wanted to have um, examples of uh, production environments, of bigger production environments where the tool is running in and uh, wanted to have, uh, a, let's say, a kind of a proof for performance. Yeah. So uh, we, we have been looking at, uh, at uh, this uh, Cisco uh, stuff. Uh, we have been uh, looking at, uh, a lot of other stuff like, uh, I don't remember all the stuff we, we were looking at, um, uh, but uh, at the end, uh, the outcome was that uh, Calico was uh, the most matching tool we could uh, implement in our clusters. So uh, we started implementing Calico. Makes sense. And is there a load balancer or a, you know, what's your load balancing infrastructure? Well, uh, as of now, we mostly have F5 as a load balancer outside the cluster. Um, uh, this might change in the future, but uh, there are no concrete plans as of now. Okay. And, and do you have an integration from, F, from your, your Kubernetes cluster to F5, or do you statically configure the F5 to point to the, the masters? Actually, let me that, try an SS. That, that matters on the implementation of the cluster. So uh, if, if, if I have to talk about this in deep, then uh, we have to uh, uh, get you onboarded in SAP. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't have to know about that. Um, so, but one of the things I'm curious about is since you have a set number of master nodes, how do you um, handle load balancing workers back to the API server? Is there a load balancer in front of that? How do they know the scope of the load balancers? I mean, uh, I, I, I didn't get the que a question due to audio problems, but uh, do you mean the, uh, how, how we, uh, the, uh, the nodes and the kubelet and all the, uh, the stuff connecting to the API server gets to know where the API servers are? Yes, that was my question. Okay, that is served by DNS. So basically, we have a DNS with a round robin uh, that uh, basically knows at any time on which nodes there are master instances. Okay, so you don't load balance, you just count on a round robin for that? Yes. Is that something the registration server updates? Well, uh, there's, there's uh, let's say, the, the cluster internal service uh, implementations are using uh, the cluster internal service. Yeah, for, for the masters, but not all the tools can use this at the point in time. So uh, like, like uh, the, if you build up the networking on the node, it needs a connection to the API. And uh, with that, uh, you need some uh, kind of information outside of the cluster um, where you can get the information, how can I find my master uh, servers where I can access the API to get my network configuration from? Because at this point in time, you're not able to connect through the uh, through the uh, through the IP network where the um, where the, uh, the cluster IP is served. I guess sorry, they, so like Kubelet checks the the DNS record, which is external to the cluster. 
but where what is setting the DNS record? Uh, well, the DNS record is maintained by the registration service once again. Okay, gotcha. gotcha. Uh, so uh, uh, the, the masters, uh, the master pod deployment uh, is also communicating with the registration service. You get you have the benefit of of having a well defined cluster, so you know that you know, you, the registration service pretty much knows what the cluster is going to be as it goes to do the deployment. It sounds like honestly, the registration service basically knows nothing. Okay. Because uh, the registration service only knows what is uh, stored in the ad city. And the ad city basically owns the overall configuration. Right. So the registration service itself is more or less stateless. Do you pre populate the data in ad city for registration? As a, is there a, like an inventory file or an inventory that defines how the cluster is going to get configured so that you have a static, static addresses and things like that? Uh, well, no static addresses, but uh, yes, we have a uh, kind of an inventory where we configure uh, which versions of which software to take, uh, which networks we have in the cluster, and uh, which IP ranges uh, should be served in the cluster, which VLANs we have in which networks, and all this stuff. Okay, that's awesome. Okay, that makes a lot and of sense. Then that that's it. This is this is basically stored here in the etcd, in the etcd cluster, yeah, and uh, this etcd cluster uh, has configurations for multiple Kubernetes clusters, not only for one. Right, that makes sense. And then the registration, you bring up a registration server in the cluster that then provisions everything in the cluster. So that uh, makes well, sense. The registration service is running on the deployment nodes, also in a container. Yeah. I guess but the definition is, of in cluster is, is a little ambiguous here. Yeah, yeah exactly. Because uh, we only have an etcd cluster in the deployment uh, uh, nodes. And uh, you could define it as a deployment server cluster as mentioned here. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, then you, you have to de define if it's the deployment server etcd cluster, if it's the deployment server cluster, or if it's the Kubernetes cluster, or the etcd cluster in the Kubernetes cluster, or the master cluster in the <laughs> Kubernetes cluster. So cluster means nothing anymore, yes. Exactly. Okay. Fair we have multiple That's clusters good. building up the cluster. <laughs> All right, I'm almost, I, I think I'm about out of questions. So if somebody else wants to take that over. <laughs> I'm questioning. But any other questions for Stefan? I'm kind of curious on the, uh, uh, you said, so there's that master node that brings up the etcd, uh, or sorry, that bootstrap uh, master node that brings up etcd, and then once you get up to, you know, minimum master size, uh, you switch to etcd being in cluster. How do you do the operation of transferring the data over? Well, basically, we only have one etcd running uh, outside of the Kubernetes cluster, which is uh, basically the first node that comes up in the cluster. Yeah? And uh, the second node already gets the master pod as desired, uh, containing the etcd. And when this pod comes up, it synchronizes with the first etcd, so that we have the data already twice in the, in the, in the overall Kubernetes cluster. And after uh, the amount of nodes has been reached, so that we have one more node, then we uh, uh, want to have masters in the cluster. Then uh, the initial uh, server, that's the first server we deployed in the cluster, gets rebooted. And due to the reboot, it gets a normal node. So we don't have an uh, outside Kubernetes etcd anymore then. Yeah, but the, so your etcd is, configure like is there like an init container that brings up your etcd to have it do any member add member remove kind of operation yes, exactly yeah okay. this is all integrated don't ask for details <laughs> <laughs> I can only say it's all integrated. 
Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm delighted that you're able to share as much as this. This is fantastic. Uh, that's really, really helpful information. I mean, uh, to be honest, uh, this kind of setup you have also at JD.com, Microsoft, or Google. So uh, even IBM has such such a kind of setup. So I mean, they don't have exactly the same setup for sure, but um, it's it's likewise. Right. I, yeah. This is this is a pattern that I want I want us to be able to discuss and document because I I agree with you. Um, this we're seeing this. Um, this more and more, and I, it's important for people to understand how to how to replicate it. Yeah, uh, I cannot explain you how to replicate it, but uh, <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll figure that out in discussion with a whole bunch of operators because we need we need to have everybody come together to figure out what works in their environments. So. It took us a couple of weeks to do that. I I, I would imagine so. <laughs> <laughs> Only. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. Cool. Other other questions? I would I would I would let us wrap up. Oh, we have a question. No, we can't hear you. Um, so I'm reading a question for John um, or Jean, uh, who want to know more about CoScale. Can you elaborate on what you like about them and how you hope they would improve? Well. Uh, Basically, uh, I, I tried to explain that already. Um, I mean, a co-scale is easy to set up from the server perspective and from the agent perspective so that we can monitor our Kubernetes clusters and the containers in the Kubernetes cluster as well as the container lifecycle in the cluster. Uh, we just have to deploy a daemon set. And then basically it's done. Yeah, uh, they they have uh, a lot of functionality, like uh, also the uh, implementation uh, with uh, artifactual intelligence, meaning the alarmony detection, where you can uh, put alerts on, so that if anything goes crazy in the cluster that is not usual, uh, then you can uh, get an alert automatically. And uh, I mean. Just think about uh, the stuff if you uh, think about what the future would be. Yeah, uh, Today, you might have uh, a, big, a big service like uh, NetWeaver, a standalone application. Yeah, uh, But in the future, we are running for microservices, uh, for functions as a service. So we decouple this single service to uh, a lot of thousand services. So how would you like to maintain that? How would you like to monitor that? If, if you cannot monitor that, then you're out. And uh, basically with that implementation that CoScale delivers, uh, while CoScale has a Kubernetes API integration, so you're not, uh, uh, you don't, don't have to run a specific uh, container runtime like the most uh, implementations require Docker. Yeah, um, but with Postgres, you're not. Uh, you don't need to run Docker. You also can run Rocket, or you can have a CRI implementation. And uh, they also are working on the CRI implementation so that they can serve more information about the cluster through the CRI interface. Um, so, so they are working on the cutting edge, I would say, implementations in Kubernetes to get them uh, integrated in uh, in Postgres also. Yeah, so uh, that we are, um, yeah, in the cutting edge of monitoring, I would say, with CoScale. Stefan Emanuel here. Could you talk about um, the situation where something goes wrong is detected? What's the process? Is there, how is it? How easy is it to back up and restore clusters and, and what's the process when something goes wrong? Well, uh, we have an implementation which we never needed as of now, but uh, we have an implementation where we are able to restore an etcd. So uh, if, if we talk about the Kubernetes cluster, yeah, um, we are able to uh, set a configuration option in the deployment etcd cluster 
so that we say, okay, hey, I want to restore the etcd here, yeah? So we boot up the first node in the cluster. That it would be a disaster recovery. So all the cluster is down, and we need to build it up from scratch. Yeah. Um, so uh, we can set an option there that we can put the data back up that we have um, back into the cluster. And after this is done, uh, we then uh, uh, give it a, a hook uh, so that it knows. Okay data is placed, I can continue booting up and restoring the data. And from that on, we can continue like a standard setup with, with the restored etcd data. Got it. W would it affect the monitoring of CoScale, for instance, or would that be separate? Uh, well, I would say you get an alert for sure, at least one, that your cluster is not working. Uh, I mean, uh, cluster is down, so you get alerts, that's normal. Uh, but uh, at the end, if the cluster is back up and running, uh, it would not affect CoScale because uh, CoScale is as uh, the cluster restored in the cluster and uh, the servers are communicating again with the CoScale server. So there is no more an issue if everything runs smoothly again. Got it, thanks. Welcome. Um, probably uh, I have to add some something more uh, on the on the question of uh, Yun. Or I don't know how your name is spelled, so I hope it's okay. Uh, yeah, um, there is uh, CoScale is also working on other stuff than only the uh, Kubernetes implementations. They also work on stuff like open tracing and and stuff. So. Uh, that the integration with uh, more advanced uh, microservices and uh, implementations that uh, are going to be faced in the future uh, is also uh, a topic they are they are taking on, and uh, that uh, makes me uh, at least confident uh, that uh, the decision for CoScale that uh, we took in our team. Uh, is not going to be reverted uh, at least in the next couple of months to say, because uh, you all know that the Kubernetes market is a fast moving uh, market. But yeah. uh, I, I think uh, that uh, I, I saw uh, what developed in the last two years. Yeah. So I don't see um, anything that developed that is uh, as good as CoScale. Uh, I didn't see that for uh, uh, when we decided for CoScale. I don't see anything coming up now. So um, I, I at least guess, uh, my, let's say my gut feeling is that uh, CoScale will stay up front. All right, that's awesome. We're just about at the top of the hour, so I was gonna last, yeah, uh, amazing notes. Thank you. Chris, that was great. Uh, Stefan, this is super impressive um, and really helpful for you to share, so thank you. Do you have links to the notes and can you add them to the minutes? Or for the slides, sorry. I, I don't have an official link, but I can uh, provide a slide deck. That would be fantastic. Thank you. Welcome. Um, I'll, I'm going to, we'll, we'll get the recording up on YouTube and I will, I will send out um, on the cluster ops SIG uh, Slack channel, I will post the uh, link to the recording and it'll go into the minutes also. So uh, hopefully that won't take me too long to turn around, but probably tomorrow. Yeah. Excellent. So, so whenever you uh, have the recording ready, um, yeah, I'll, pass, I'll okay. pass it back to you directly. I'll, I'll, I'll contact you one-on-one -on -one directly to tell you where exactly. the link is. Yeah. That yeah. would be nice. No problem. Thank you. This is great. Welcome. Everybody, I appreciate it. Uh, two weeks, so not next week. Um, our schedule would have us the, the Thursday after. So I will hopefully join us again then, and I'll talk to you then. Thank you. Come.
Bye. Thank you.